It's like, all right, welcome everyone. I'm so glad that you're here. I'm really excited about today's workshop. Um, my name is Janice Whitlock and I'm the Associate Director for Teaching and Training for the Bronfman Brenner Center for Translational Research. Um, today, you have joined us for the workshop, How to Transform Your Research into Riveting Stories that People Remember. It's gonna be presented by Keisha Anderson, who's an author, poet, and communication specialist. I'll tell you a little bit more about her in a minute. Um, today's workshop is part of the BCTR series, How to Do Research in Real World Settings, a core extension of BCTR's mission to expand, strengthen, and speed the connection between research policy and practice in service of human development and well-being. Before I introduce Keisha, I'd like to go over just a few quick present presentation logistics. Um, we set this up as a meeting so that it'll allow for more interactivity. So if you could please just be sure you're on mute, that'd be great. It's not something we can control. Um, we're um, going to be recording this, so just so you know that it's recording. Uh, if you have questions, Keisha has allowed time and has some interactivity built in, and there'll be time at the end for Q&A, but if you have questions as we go along, um, and you, you can raise your hand or put it in the chat, and we'll monitor that and let Keisha know, so feel free to do that if you want to clarify if you have something that's relevant to what's being said at that moment. All right, let me tell you a little bit about Keisha. Um, Keisha is a Jamaican-born poet, author, and visual artist based in Brooklyn, whose books include A Spell for Living, Everything is Necessary, and Gathering the Waters. She's a past participant of the Rona Voices and, and Hallelujah writing workshops and holds an MFA in fiction from City College Green. In 2018, Keisha was selected as, Brooklyn's, uh, as Brooklyn Public Library Artist in Residence, most recently, she was presented with the Poetic Icon Award by her alma mater at Syracuse University. And you can learn more about her work at www.keishagrove.inc. I also want to say, though, I know Keisha through the Jed Foundation, where she is the Director of Communications. And she was also the Director of Communications at Brooklyn College. And she's worked in other community schools that, uh, in that role over 15 years. So she was invited because she has this beautiful way of being able to merge sort of the poetic and um, creative styles of writing with the sort of academic means that most of us in this setting are going to be drawing on. So without further ado, Keisha, I'm turning it over to you. Wow, what a beautiful introduction. Thank you, Janice. I um, Greetings, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you today. You could be anywhere else, but you are here with me, and we're going to talk about transforming your research into stories that people will never forget. Um, so I am going to just share my screen and then we'll get started. I'll take you through some exercises. Um, I'll give you some tips and then we'll take some questions at the end. Okay, let me see, make sure this works. I cleaned up my desktop so as not to frighten you because <laughs> it's pretty busy back there. Okay, so now I am going to present. And yes, I can still see everyone. Wonderful. Okay, let me just, I'm gonna move this box here. Um, Janice, I can see you, so just give me a thumbs up. Is, does everything look okay? Can you see? Perfect. All right, here we go. All right, I'm gonna have to collapse this, so I'm not gonna see you, but just, um, unmute and talk to me if you need to tell me anything. So a little bit about me. Yes, I have been a storyteller for a long time. Um, I started out as a journalist. I, you know, I went to Syracuse University and I started my career in broadcast journalism and print journalism. I worked for CBS and PBS in production. I've written for magazines like Teen People, Psychology Today, Black Enterprise and others. I was always a poet, um, and so it's, uh, it didn't come out of left field. It was just something I was always doing, and then I decided to take it a little further um, later on in life. But in a professional capacity, yes, I have worked in higher ed for over 15 years, and primarily my role in various uh, leadership roles in communications at those schools was to help faculty um, and researchers translate their work uh, so that we could pitch that out to the media and they could get a wider audience and um, a more diverse audience of people to understand and connect with what 
um, they were working on very important research. And so we needed to go through a process of different forms of storytelling to help promote their work. So today I hope to you know, help uh, educate and you to learn how to educate, inspire and influence with the stories that you're telling here. Um, and so we'll just start to go through that process. All right. All right, so what is a story? I mean, I think we all instinctively know what stories are, right? Stories are just a means of transferring information, experience, or an attitude. And really, you know, from the earliest days of humanity, we've been telling stories. And they help us reflect on our lives, right? Um, they help us to pass on cultural knowledge. Um, and stories also support the continuity of traditions and other accumulated human knowledge. And there's something just instinctive, you know when you hear a good story, but there is a science to it. Um, so we're going to try to talk about that a little bit and um, learn some techniques for how we can tell our own stories. Okay. So one of my favorite authors of all time, Miss Toni Morrison, um, I was very honored to read at one of the many memorials, the Center for Fiction had a memorial for her and they selected some authors to read, you know, parts of her work, but she, uh, she's a master storyteller. And I chose this quote to really illustrate the difference between conveying information and telling a story that people connect with, right? So she says, make up a story for our sake and yours, forget your name in the street, Tell us what the world has been to you in the dark places and the light. Don't tell us what to believe, what to fear. Show us belief's wide skirt and the stitch that unravels fear's call, right? So, you know, there is, there's an art to doing this and it involves engaging our senses, connecting with people on many different levels. And that's what storytelling does. That's why it's memorable. So, now, my pop culture references may be uh, revealing my age, <laughs> but um, I hope you all like recognize what movie this comes from, <laughs> but I think it's a good example. Um, so we'll talk about that later in the Q&A section. You can tell me. Uh, so what makes a good story, right? A good story adds value to a topic by getting the audience to connect with the message on a deep personal level, right? So if, any, if I say basically any of these phrases, like most of you can name the film, I'm pretty sure if I say, may the force be with you in your mind right away, even if you are not a fan, you know what movie I'm talking about, right? Or if I say, there is no spoon, you know, you probably know what movie I'm referencing, right? Because you've connected with that story, it's become part of our culture. Now these references, they resonate with us. We remember them, right? Or I am Groot. <laughs> Can you tell where I'm going here? I like uh, science fiction. So I'm gonna nerd out a little bit with my examples, right? Okay, so moving on. We are wired for that connection. Um, so good storytelling will help us build an emotional connection, enhance memory, command attention, and can influence behavior, which is why advertising works, frankly. I mean, we hate to see those ads when they pop up and we're watching stuff, but those jingles, they can't get out of our head. There's a reason for that, right? So what happens in your brain when you hear a good story is neurons fire in the same patterns as the speaker's brain. That's known as neural coupling, right? And through a process psychologists call narrative transport, Good stories engage listeners emotionally. Engaged emotions create empathy with the speaker. And stories activate motor, auditory, and olfactory and visual parts of the brain. So in a 2006 study, this is an old study, but I thought it was a good example, uh, published in the journal Neuroimage, researchers in Spain asked participants to read words with strong odor associations along with neutral words. So while their brains were being scanned by the uh, magnetic re resonance imaging, MRI machine, 
when subjects looked at words for perfume, like perfume and coffee, their primary uh, olfactory cortex lit up. And when they saw words that mean chair and key, the region remained dark, right? So the way the brain handles metaphors, um, you know, scientists have contended that figures of speech, like I've had a rough day, they're so familiar um, and they're treated as simply words, but at no more. And, you know, we, we know that um, images involving like texture uh, and other sensory details um, help us to really remember, uh, you know, someone had a velvet voice, he had leathery hands. These rouse the sensory cortex, right? And, uh, you know, singers, the information like the singer had a pleasing voice, they're not as memorable. They're not as memorable. So I think, again, my, you know, pop culture references, they're a little dated, but I'm, I'm willing to bet everybody knows what movie this is. <laughs> a good story puts your entire mind to work, right? Effective communication relies on common ground, shared experiences and beliefs. And this is key because researchers and scholars are subject matter experts. They have deep knowledge of one particular thing. What we wanna do is to take that particular thing and to show whoever our audience is how that connects to their lives. Okay, all right. Now, I uh, chose this quote, I love Carl Sagan. I'm, I'm just uh, very impressed with him and, um, and as you may know, he, he taught at Cornell for a long time, I think till the end of his life. But um, I really liked this quote, so I thought I would include it. A book is made from a tree. It is an assemblage of flat, flexible parts, still called leaves, imprinted with dark pigmented squiggles. At one glance at it and you hear the voice of another person, perhaps someone dead for thousands of years across the millennia the author is speaking clearly and silently inside your head directly to you. Writing is perhaps the greatest of human inventions, binding together people, citizens of this effort. Ooh, pardon, does somebody wanna say something? No, okay, I'll keep going. Um, people who never knew one another. Books break the shackles of time, proofs that, proof that humans can work magic, right? So, I, I want us to get very, you know, used to this idea of how stories connect people, right? And we can all learn how to do this. We can all learn how to do this. I mean, the, the spark of creativity that, that makes you want to tell a story, makes you want to write or create something, that's highly personal and individual. And you can't really teach that, but I, you can teach the ways in which we can convey that information so that it... Uh, resonates with people. All right, so we're gonna read a story now, and then we're going to try this little poll so I can get your reactions. So just bear with me, it's the first time I'm using this poll everywhere thing, but I want you to, I'm gonna put, oops, I am going to put this, I'm gonna put this in the chat and let me, aha, uh -huh. how do I get to the chat? <laughs> Goodness. Go, go down to the bottom of the screen. You shan't look for the chat. No, I know. I just have to enlarge this so that I can, I'm going to, let me stop sharing for a second. I'll put this in the chat. I will put the story here. All right. Uh, does everyone have that link? Yes. Okay. And then I'm also going to put this link. So I want you to take, ah, uh, I'd say this is a five to seven minute read. And then when you're done, I want you to go over to this poll and then type in what emotion or theme the story evoked for you. Okay. Um, so let's take, let's just take 10 minutes to do this whole process. So I'm going to, yep. 
All right, starting now.
take like two more minutes. Okay, um, it seems like most people are finished. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm glad this technology worked. <laughs> All right, so um, yeah, that uh, is, pardon me, let's move this up here. It's hardly a new short story, as you can see, it's from like 1978, but it's a good one because Let's just say, you know, if I were writing about uh, womanhood or girlhood in the Caribbean or feminism, you know, my, my paper may be called, uh, my paper abstract may include, I'm interrogating Caribbean feminist theory and activism in relation to the Euro-American experience and to challenge emerging third world discourse, right? Which is great. And it's, you know, it, it's a heavy topic, but I, I shared this with you because this is really illustrating that idea of what it's like to, to be a girl, um, you know, in Caribbean society at that time, uh, you know, in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And um, I'm, I'm from the Caribbean, so <laughs> I chose the world I know, but just what it's really like is to, it's to show me, don't tell me, show me what is it like to have all these responsibilities and this weight on you? What does it feel like? And this author's style, this is her particular style. That's another thing I want to say to you. Whatever information that you want to share, eventually you're going to give it your own style. And this is her particular style. And now that she's been writing so long, it's recognizable. Now, um, you know, I understand that fiction is, is a different genre, but I'm showing this to you because of the vivid language, the descriptions, the sensory details. Um, this can all be applied to nonfiction. This can all be applied to uh, translating scholarship into, um, you know, articles for consumer magazines and consumer, you know, mainstream media. Uh, and you really want to be the navigator and at the helm of that. Um, I know a lot of professors I, I've worked with were very nervous about um, getting it right and, and getting their research right and didn't want to dumb it down. And we're never going to dumb it down, but it's a different type of communication. And that's all it is. So you want to be skilled in, in just being flexible and being able to communicate what you're saying in different ways so that people will connect with it. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, overwhelmed is what I felt too. <laughs> it's like, seems to be the most popular response. All right, let me go back here. So, and I'm going to move this little window over here. Right. Um, okay. So structuring your story. As I said, there are tons of different genres, as you know. I think you all have some you know, level of familiar, familiarity with this. But for people who are researchers and scholars, I think it's important to bring out these two structures for storytelling that will just help you say, you know, you, you are the um, you know, principal investigator on a big research project that's gonna blow people away and 
you know, you're on a team and you have to work with my office. You have to work with communications to get this story out. I am going to bring you through a process that is going to be structured somewhat like this. I, I shared the, the one on the left for fiction just because in, our, in magazines like the New Yorker or the Atlantic or, uh, you know, with long feature writing, it is sort of structured like fiction. It is, it does build. It does, you know, create a, a scene, put you in the place and then take you through a journey. Long form journalism is not dead at all. Um, long form storytelling is still very much alive. And even if you are working in the audio format, like if you're on a podcast, you need to be able to build and tell your story uh, to create that interest and suspense. And um, here are some ways to do it. Here are some structures. As you know, this in inverted uh, pyramid for the news story, um, this, I think a lot of people already know how to do this, but if, you know, if you're pitching to uh, a news publication about some research, you're gonna wanna put the most newsworthy information right at the top and then go down in this way um, with the other relevant details, right? So, okay. Um, so let's just go through in a little more detail what these are. So there are some essential storytelling elements. And mm. I think, again, for our purposes, um, since we're not talking about screenwriting or playwriting or, you know, we're, I think for, for this audience, you're mostly probably looking at think pieces, essays, news stories, even grant writing, right? So there are some common essential elements that you're going to need to structure this story. The premise is really, it's the main idea. What is this about? What's the main idea? So it might be, your premise is like a definitive statement. It's climate change is real. Climate change is real is gonna be your argument, right? And then, you know, you want to, you want to hook people with this, with this idea. You wanna make a strong statement that's definitive and you are the expert. You're going to be presented as the expert um, who's gonna explain this. I, I worked, for a long time um, um, with booking producers, placing faculty on shows, and I would coach them. Um, some people were better at it than others, but the ones who were called back time and time again to be on news programs uh, and what have you, um, were you know the ones who could really get that succinct uh, pitch down, right? Um, if you see me look away, I have children here, so, you know, it's the, <laughs> it's the quarantine thing, so please excuse me um, if, if I look, I'm not distracted. All right, second thing is theme, central topic or idea, right? So if our premise is climate change is real, we might want to say the, the, the central idea is that, you know, conservation of the environment is, is what we're going to talk about broadly, right? And then, you know, stories need conflict, right? So we think of conflict in fiction and um, we think of conflict in films or what have you, but, you know, it's compelling when you're reading uh, or you're listening to someone talk about their work and there is an opposing force and they're pushing against that and they're going to prove their case or, you know, uh, debunk something or, or just enlighten us and bring us some new information that we've never had before, right? So this research will show why those opposing climate change are wrong. That can be the conflict, right? Um, you may, you're not going to say it that way, but through uh, talking about your work, you are going to speak to that, right? And then the stakes, people want stakes. They wanna know like, like, why does this even matter? Like what's at stake here? What's at stake has to connect to their personal lives. It has to connect to something that they care about. And, you know, I know it's, it's difficult because um, a lot of, you know, popular media really does appeal to the most base level of, of like <laughs> human impulses. But on some level, we have to plug in to like just things that everyone cares about and then back into what we're talking about and get more specific and more specific, right? Um, so what's at stake? Why should I care? Rising sea levels are destroying people's lives, right? You know, that's, that's why you should care. Um, if you're a good person, you should care about that. And then narrative thread. So what happens from stage to stage? Taking us through these points should prove your premise 
and be consistent with the overall theme. And, and the way we tell the narrative, like I said, if you're, uh, you know, um, if your work is being explored in a more, in a longer format, or even in like a documentary format, like a, a Ken Burns documentary, right? It builds, it builds, um, you know, to a climax and it's more structured like fiction. If you're on a news program, say, you know, you're on 60 Minutes or 2020 or um, on a, you know, Frontline, <laughs> Nightline or whatever, a, a major news program and you have, you know, you have, uh, you're on the show, say you're on one of the morning shows and you have like five minutes, they've booked you for five minutes to talk about your, your new thing. You've got to use that news format. You've got to s tell us why it matters. Why is it relevant? Tell us right at the top and then select particular details that are relatable to the lay audiences. And then you can, all the beautiful thing about the age we're living in is that you can direct people to the paper if they really have the aptitude or the interest to read a, re a long research paper or some other um, document, they can. They can, read, they can read the research. And journalists will do that. Um, journalists who are science journalists or business journalists. I've, um, you know, when I was working in at business magazines, I had to pour over a lot of documents um, that most people would not be reading. And I had, to, I had to develop a skill of distilling that information for the particular audience of the publication where I worked. And that takes a little practice, okay? All right, so I think you all know this, but I just want to, you know, give us a greater understanding of academic writing versus journalistic writing. Like I said, journalism is just one uh, funnel for uh, sharing your research. It's just one avenue. There are so many, the beautiful thing is, the great thing is there are so many platforms and so many ways to talk about your research and what you're working on and your expertise with the general public. The drawback is there's a lot of noise. There's everybody's got a, 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 some sort of platform or they're content creators. The, the advantage that you have as researchers or scholars or academics is that you are the only expert or one of a very few, you know, a handful of experts on the thing. You're the person we go to, um, you know, you're the person we go to for that thing. So if you, if you become really good at explaining really simply what that thing is, then it gives you an opportunity to have subsequent interactions where you can really explain further in more detail, lecture, whatever it is, right? So, you know, academic writing is, is formal in tone, has a progressive structure. It's, I'm going to give you information and here's how I'm gonna give you the information. I'm going to have sources, I'm going to have data, I'm gonna analyze this information, here's the information. Journalistic and other type of writing, it's, it's brief, um, it's anecdotal, People like stories. People like to hear a story. I mean, it goes back to our very, very basic instincts. It's why we love movies. Even, you know, music. Music tells a story. We remember song. Why do we know songs by heart? The music is another component, and we won't get into that in terms of what music does and why we remember things when we sing. But um, people do remember stories, right? So I have some examples here. Um, this is a, uh, let me look at the time. I think we're good. Here's a professor I worked with years ago, a uh, brilliant professor. Um, and he, let me move this. I don't know if you can, uh, there we go. He was brilliant and he made a discovery about blueberries. So here is the abstract uh, from their work. And we'll just take a moment to read this. So edible blueberry species are well recognized for their potential health benefits. I'm, I'm, I'm going to definitely mispronounce these words. So I'm gonna let you read it. I'm gonna give you a minute to read it. <laughs> and if, um, if you could please mute, um, that would be great. Thank you. All right, so clearly um, 
this content, it's, it's for a very specific audience of people who are the experts, right, in this field of study. So, you know, then we worked together and he was, I loved working with him because he was very good at helping me understand what he was talking about. So now this is one of the articles um, that came out of pitching his research, right? Latin American blueberries found to be extreme superfruits. Uh, and it starts off painting a scene. One of the treats of summer, fresh antioxidant rich blueberries has new competition for the title of superfruit. Now, I'm not saying this is the most brilliantly written news article, but it did travel a lot. It got traction. People read it. People wanted to know more. They wanted to talk to him about his work because it was accessible, right? So researchers have found that two species of wild blueberry native to the tropic, tropical regions of Central and South America contain two to four times more antioxidants. So what's the story? We, there's this new research on blueberries and it's, um, you know, the language is accessible. It's even got this informal tone. It's conversational, right? But at least the contenders are keeping the title in the family. It's supposed to be funny. It's a little corny, but it's all right though. You want to keep reading. The finding is the result of analysis of the compounds contained in uh, neotropical blueberries grown at the New York Botanical Garden. I can understand that. Um, the analysis itself is in the paper. And if I really want to know that, I can read further. The paper's linked at the end of the article. Then we go down and down. Who did the study? Here's a quote. You know, no one had looked at this before. Why is that important? That's important because this is something new that no one was working on. That's what makes it newsworthy, right? And then we go down and there's the journal link. So, um, that's just an example of how I, you know, I personally have worked with uh, faculty to help them translate their work um, in different ways, right? Let's move on. Here's another example. So I'm going to play some media after you read this, but here's an example of a paper uh, about forced displacement. While forced displacement is often linked to a single proximate cause, such as a war or natural disaster, the reality is that it occurs within a much broader context involving issues such as historical struggles between racial and ethnic groups, access to natural resources and livelihoods, environmental change or degradation and political dynamics at local state and international levels. While there has been some development of a structure of international norms through the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the United Nations Convention relating to the status of refugees, the complex overlapping issues imply that each situation has its unique set of issues and concerns that must be addressed. The Somali refugees in Northeastern Kenya are one case in point. So here's a very, um, it's not a scientific uh, or in the way that we understand, it's not biological sciences, it's not chemistry. Um, I can understand the words that are here, most people could, but it is just giving me information, which is fine. Information has its place. But if I want to really understand on a, on a, on a heart level, like what, what does this mean, right? Um, I am going to play, I'm going to play this poem for you and then we can get some reactions. So uh, you should be able to hear it. Let me know for some reason you cannot. All right. Oh. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. Your neighbors running faster than you, breath bloody in their throats. And the boy you went to school with who kissed you dizzy behind the old tin factories, holding a gun bigger than his body. You only leave home when home won't let you stay. No one leaves home unless home chases you, fire under feet, hot blood in your belly. And even then you carry the anthem under your breath only tearing up your passport in airport toilets, sobbing as each mouthful of paper made it clear that you would not be going back. You have to understand, 
And no one would put their children in a boat unless the sea is safer than the land. No one burns their palms under trains, beneath carriages. No one spends days and nights in the gallbladder of a truck feeding on newspaper unless the miles traveled means something more than journey. No one crawls under fences, wants to be beaten, wants to be pitied. No one chooses refugee camps or strip searches where your body is left aching or prison because prison is safer than a city of fire and one prison guard in the night is safer than 14 men who look like your father. No one could take it, could stomach it. No one skin would be tough enough to go home blacks, refugees dirty immigrants, asylum seekers, sucking our country dry, niggers with their hands out, they smell strange, savage, messed up their own country and now they want to mess up ours? How do the words, dirty looks, roll off your back and maybe it's because the blow is softer than a limb torn off? Or the words are more tender than 14 men between your legs. Or the insults are easier to swallow than rubble, than bone, than your child's body in pieces. I want to go home. But home is the mouth of a shark. Home is the barrel of a gun. And no one would leave home unless home chased you to the shore. Unless home told you to quicken your legs. Leave your clothes behind. Crawl through the desert. Wade for the oceans, drown, save, be hungry, beg, forget pride. Your survival is more important. No one leaves home unless home is a sweaty voice in your ear saying, leave, run away from me now. I don't know what I've become, but I know that anywhere is safer than here. All right. So I'm a poet, so you know I'm going to share poems with you. And I know you're not writing poetry, but I believe um, poem is uh, poetry is, it, first of all, it's one of the oldest forms of storytelling. And I think I would even say probably the first that human beings have used with one another. But because the hallmark of, of this particular genre is extremely descriptive language, um, connecting with people on an emotional level. And, and that neural coupling I'm talking about, if you got teary-eyed when you heard that, I always do when I listen to that poem. That is what I'm talking about, that a story putting your whole brain to work. You can uh, understand what she's saying, but you also feel what she's saying. And while you are not necessarily going to be writing poems, you are going to have to get at that connection point with other people through whatever you're talking about. Um, as you are talking about your particular areas of expertise. So let's, let's think about some questions. And, um, you know, when we get into our discussion phase, we can discuss that piece or, or anything else, really. We have plenty of time, and I'll answer your questions. But uh, some questions for you to consider when turning your scholarship into stories that people um, will remember is, is it timely? Um, it's a tough one because some things, you know, people are researching them for a really, really long time, but there may be something in the current national or global conversation that rises up and it's the right time. So pay attention to that. Sometimes it's like the right time to talk about a particular thing. Um, you know, if we were speaking about refugees, I, you know, there, there, there came a time where that was in the news cycle. And I also want you to not feel like the news cycle that you are going to be um, pitching your work out um, and you're somehow like beholden to this news cycle. You can create news, you can generate news if you have a, a great breakthrough or a discovery or something, but just pay attention to how you can plug it into the current conversations people are having. So you can add value to those conversations. So you can raise your hand in the noise of people who are not experts. Everyone is tweeting and, and has a website and has a YouTube channel. And it's very confusing because many of them are not qualified to give um, expert advice on things, whereas you are, You're, you've been trained to do this. So you need to know how to insert yourself in those conversations. Can people easily understand your central idea? 
Again, this comes down to the use of language, using vivid language, descriptive language, similes and metaphors, which we use in poetry, comparing things, you know, it's um, the blueberry is as a super fruit. People understand that. Um, super fruit is not a scientific term, but we get it. It's, it's in our lexicon. It's just how we, ref, you know, refer to um, certain things at a certain time when we're talking about health, right? Will people connect emotionally to your subject, right? So here's the what's in it for me. Why should they care? Why should they care? And we're not necessarily asking people to do anything, but from a human level, I care about climate change, say if that's what I'm writing about or you know, I care about human rights. Um, not everybody cares, but I think most people will um, if they can see themselves in it, right? Will people find value in the topic? Again, it's, you know, it's the what's in it for me. And um, is, is it a story or a statement? Um, plenty of times I've worked with faculty and they're working on something, but there's no story there. It's a statement. Um, how do we make it a story? A story takes you on a journey. You know, there was a professor at Brooklyn College who was studying like the algae in Prospect Park. And, and so like, what did that have to do with anything? Um, so we had to find those connection points. What's the impact? Um, you know, it was overgrowing. It was like these poisonous blooms of algae and that had implications for the, the local environment. Um, you know, it wasn't great. So she was trying to solve that problem and that mattered to people, at least in this locality, right? How was the conflict resolved or the problem solved? Um, and, uh, you know, I think these are, there's, there's a lot more to consider, but I, I thought these were the most relevant uh, for you as you're just starting to think about how you want to talk about your work. Um, let's see, do I have another slide? Yes. Broaden your reach, right? Like I said, it's noisy. Um, all the social platforms, you want to make sure that what you are talking about can make the biggest impact um, possible. So you want to aim for the place, you know, the right connection point to share this information. You know, where's the audience? Think about that, right? And um, there you will have more luck. But once you get to that point where you can identify a broad audience, like generally say, we are talking about the environment, like what's, what's the broad audience for that? Then we have to think about using vivid but accessible language so that both experts and like non-scholars can understand what you're talking about, right? Um, you know, well, we're gonna talk about Hemingway, but that's, that was Hemingway's success, right? The, the simplicity and, of his writing. And he was a trained journalist. So you can understand, um, you know, he wanted to make his work really accessible to anyone. And he succeeded with that. And also his style is really identifiable as him. So that's a good example of um, honing your style, you know, using simple language. Um, so, right. So people who are not subject matter experts, you want them to be able to understand uh, what you're talking about. And I believe that's it for me. <laughs> I think I ended a little early. Well, no, we have about uh, nine minutes more, but we have, uh, we have another 30 minutes or more um, so I can take your questions. I will put this information in the chat um, if you want to reach out to me and connect. But um, I thank you for your time and uh, let's take some questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And... I will put that in the chat. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Fisha. Are there questions for Fisha? <laughs> Where did my presentation go? Okay. Um, feedback, questions, thoughts, like I'm, you can literally ask me anything. Um, again, I've, you know, as a poet, I've read, I've been all over on different stages. I've connected with people um, that way. Uh, I'm, I was a journalist, you know, I worked on films. I worked in higher ed and communication, strategic communication. So I am happy to answer like questions about anything at all. 
And so what you can do, I think, is uh, you can unmute and just you can just ask a question. Hi, Keisha. Hi. Hi, <laughs> thank you so much for um, your your talk. Um, so uh, I'm a pretty avid uh, reader of both um, uh, poetry and, and fiction, and I have a good sense about like what a story is. However, I think it's a completely different process of trying to go from data and trying to go, and that's just my specific thing, I do neuroscience, trying to go from, from data and the need for specificity, given say a scientific um, audience, um, while staying away from jargon. So I was wondering a little bit about more of like the process part of like mm -hmm. worksheets, specific questions that you should be asking yourself, a way to actually go from, you know, mm -hmm. here's the data to here is um, the narrative that's a bit more, you know, equivalent of like, how do I, um, you know, increase my uh, mile speed, right? Like you have a training that you do. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if there's something like that in terms mm -hmm. of like real process stuff that, that yeah. might help us get yes. to where we're, we want to go. I, yes. And I, so what I would suggest um, with the data points that you have, you know, first of all, I do think there still needs to be that premise, that big idea, like what the heck, what are we talking about here, right? But with the data, I would pull out the data points and, you know, the ones that you want to highlight and see how they can tell a story. What are they actually saying? You know, if I um, see like, um, I don't know, 30% uh, of uh, college students across the country say that um, they don't have uh, adequate, I don't know, Wi-Fi. This is not true or something, what, how can I visualize the person's life? Like, what does that mean for them? What you want to ask, like, so what? What, is, what does it mean? What is, I have this number, but what does that actually, where is an example, you know, that you can show where this is actually impacting someone's daily life? If you zoom out and you take one person and you do, Imagine a day in the life of that person for whom this data set, like they are included in that data set. What, what does that mean for that person? That's always a good exercise. Like, so, you know, we know this in school, like, uh, you know, Johnny went to the store. Johnny bought a, uh, Johnny sees three apples. He takes one. How many apples are left? Like, but, but for me, I was like, well, what's the store look like? Where is Johnny? Where does Johnny live? Right? So I would suggest um, taking the data and creating real life examples. And then from there, even if they're fictitious, from there, you can think about what do I need to look, where do I need to look in my research for the actual case studies or like, or the testimonials or the, the people. Does this make sense? I hope this is helpful. Yeah, I, I definitely get the sense of the, you know, one of the process questions is to ask, so what, right? So yeah, you have this finding and maybe it's like something to do with mitochondria, but so what, right? What, mm -hmm. what matters about that? Okay, thank yeah. you. You're welcome. I don't know if you can address this, but I think one of the things that academics typically struggle with is that we have to be careful about um, pulling too much on emotion. That's mm -hmm. actually, you know, one of the lines you don't want to cross too much because, um, well, for reasons that you understand, it kind of violates the sense of objectivity or mm -hmm. distance from the research. Um, and yet, I also understand that people really resonate with emotions and stories more than anything else. And I know that those of us who want to be impactful and maybe have research that can be impactful really consistently walk this line. Mm. I'm wondering if there's, you know, if you've seen examples of how people can do that really well. Mm-hmm. There is um, a book that is uh, a scholarly text. Okay, so we're gonna get, you're gonna like learn about me now. I'm Jamaican, right? So I'm very interested in the colonial period and I read a lot about it. I'm also interested in um, um, cultural retention and religions, okay? So there's a book um, called The Cultural Politics of Obia 
Obia is what you, you know, it's not voodoo, but like that's the closest next thing if you don't know what I'm talking about. And this scholar looks at like court records from the colonial period of people who were like uh, tortured for so-called witchcraft. And, but the way that the narrative is written, um, it almost reads like, it just reads like a nonfiction book for general audiences, but all of the research is there and it's structured like a scholarly text. I don't have uh, examples from that book to share with you off the top of my head. But uh, the thing is though, it's like, we can't always do hybrid things because if the rules, you have to function within the rules of the genre. Um, you don't have to necessarily emote too much, but academic writing has its rules and it's like for a reason it has, right? But I think one place to look is to look at, literally I have people sometimes in writing exercises circle the verbs, like this is really basic, like look at the language you're using. How can you say things differently? How can you use more vivid language? How can you put more sensory details, if applicable, it may not be applicable, like for a sociologist that makes sense or an anthropologist that makes sense you know, um, but um, I, I don't know if I'm equipped to, you know, say what should be done in academic writing. I know about creative writing, and I can tell you that if you're going to take what has been already published as an academic paper, and then now try to publicize that in the media, or give a talk about it, um, these are some, some of the techniques I shared with you that can help people connect with it better, so I don't know. Thank you. Other questions? I have a question. Uh, thanks, Keisha. That was a great talk. Um, Thank you. I was wondering, kind of, I guess, for, you know, for transforming it into the more like the quick idea at the beginning, kind of the inverted pyramid structure, mm -hmm. how do you uh, kind of keep your readers engaged when you've kind of given away the main point, as it were? Like, how do you kind of make a story when you've already told the punchline? <laughs> Right, right. That's a very good question. And the answer is you keep a little mystery. So you are going to generally say, um, you know, I think that same uh, professor um, who did the blueberries, he, he also worked with black cohosh, which helps with hot flashes. And um, the root does lots of other things. When I was talking with him, I was like, yeah, 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 it does this, this and that. But hot flashes, people can relate to that. People need help with that, right? So what you're doing in journalistic writing is you're telling the what. Um, you're telling the what, but what you're going to reveal is the how. You're going to, and this, this approach, we all know this approach even in cinema. Like sometimes you go see, I can't even think of a film where they tell you everything that happened in the beginning in the first scene and then you go back and, and you understand um, you know, what happened in that character's life. But even though you know what happened, you still want to know how it happened. You're still interested to know. And so the what has to be so intriguing that you're like, I need to read more. And we see this in a really crappy format with like clickbait. <laughs> there, there's a lot of clickbait out there because, um, you know, obviously advertising has been linked to news media forever. Advertising pays for news media. The purpose of news, newspapers historically was to bring eyeballs to ads. That is the purpose. It's not to inform you. That just happens to be one of the things it does, but the purpose is for the, to bring people to ads, right? So you want to, the how has to be unfolded like a present, like unwrapped, you know? It's like you're unfolding something and you're like, oh, 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 okay, right? Um, that's how I like to visualize it. Yeah, thanks, that's really helpful. Okay, you're welcome. Well. Any others? I've got a quick question. Sure. <laughs> Thanks so much for this talk. This is this is really wonderful. Oh, I love the science art kind of connection here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm thinking about, for example, you were saying like 60 minutes. If I'm going on there and I have five minutes to talk, uh, I know there's sort of the general like, well, just prepare for it. But if you're preparing in the wrong way, it's not going to go the way you want. So what would you recommend for that venue if, say, I'm a biologist or a psychologist? Ah, 
this is a great question because a lot of scholars, um, you know, they go to interviews and they think they're having a conversation with the reporter, but you're not having a conversation. What you're doing is giving a speech that sounds like a conversation because what you wanna do if you're on a news program is you have a small amount of time to tell the audience what you want them to know. So even when you're asked a question, you have to pivot your answer so that it incorporates what you want the audience to know. It's not, you're not really answering the question. You know, you ever, and I know um, we see this a lot in political theater. They're very good at this. So somebody will ask, uh, well, what about the embezzlement? And somebody will say, I don't know about the embezzlement, but what I do know is that we're raising monies for babies. They pivot. Here's what I know. You always want to talk about what you know. So you have to think what is the most impact. You have to get your bullet points ahead of time. You have to practice and you have to say, what is the most important thing I want people to know about my research, but also consider why should this audience care? What's going to keep their attention? You know, um, say you, you've cured cancer <laughs> and now you're on 60 minutes. It's like, that's an easy one. I have cured cancer and how did I do it? And the way I did it, I, I discovered something no one else had thought of. It's always good to, to distinguish yourself by explaining that you thought of it and others had not. You made a discovery. And then remember, here's where we do the similes and metaphor exercise. So if you're going to talk about like rhizomes and things and mitochondria and all this stuff, you have to, I would suggest to do uh, um, a sheet with columns and do a side by side where you kind of put your scientific term, whatever the term is, translate that. How, if I were talking to a 12 year old, 12 is a good cutoff. Middle school is good. They can understand. They can read Lord of the Flies. They can understand what your research is, right? <laughs> like, how would I explain this? What does it mean? You know, it's like, you're going to do this a lot. It's like this. You know, Neil deGrasse Tyson is an expert at this, by the way. And if you, I think he taught a master class, but he's really an expert at this. Yeah. So I would watch some of his videos as well. <laughs> Keisha, there's another question in the chat. Um, do you have any experience or advice about how to effectively include college students or youth in the storytelling process? Hmm. Do you mean as a professor, like, are we teaching? Just, I just need a little more detail about. I would imagine, like, I would say, imagine from the vantage point of at least somebody sitting on a university campus who's doing research from whether they're a faculty or a grad student or mm -hmm. somebody working with one of those. Hmm. It's such a broad, it is a good question. Um, I think the things for, and I have two teenagers, so I, I'm, you know, I'm somewhat of an expert of trying to connect, <laughs> but, um, you know, one of the things I'll say is like, you may have to go on TikTok. You may have, you have to use the tools that they're using to express themselves. And once you know, you know, kids think they're so smart. They think you've never seen a meme before, but a meme is just a joke. We had jokes in different formats, like before the internet right? We, we, um, we expressed, uh, there was a funny thing uh, my daughter showed me. There was a book from the 1800s, a school book, and um, the kid, all the kids' names, you know, were written in the book, and, and uh, uh, in the inside cover, it said, turn to page uh, 90, and then when you got to page 90, it said, you are a fool for looking, <laughs> and it's like, everybody knows this humor. This is middle school humor, so to get them involved, you have to have to do a little research and figure out, you know, what is important to them. You know, what is important, like the ways that they're expressing themselves now. Um, so I have taught, let's see, um, you know, I taught a course um, at Brooklyn College on Afrofuturism and like science, speculative fiction. And lucky for me, Black Panther had just come into the theaters. Now, it was one of those courses that was three hours once a week at night. And it's like, you know, you have, sometimes it's challenging in public colleges because people are working full time. They don't always come to class. I had to do things to get them interested. So I, I got like a mini grant and I bought the movie tickets and they had to write a paper about it. 
but that was effective, right? So that's what I mean. Don't be afraid to use multimedia. Don't be afraid to use video, use all the techniques, social media, and to get them to connect to how the research or the, the story like connects with their lived experience in the moment. I think I'm being sort of vague, but I, I hope this is getting at the answer a little bit. I don't know. Esther, I don't know if you have, if that, if that answered your question or not, is there a clarifying question you'd like to follow up with or is that the trick? Yep, that, that was great. Thank you for your presentation and your answer, Keisha. Um, I also had a follow-up question. So my program works with a lot of students and they're pivotal to the community engaged learning work that we do. Do you have any um, additional advice about how we can empower youth to talk about the research that they're working on in mm -hmm. the labs that they are involved in? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, yeah, there's that word. So empower, I think we, we have to entice, we have to inspire. I don't know if we can empower them, but that's a whole like polemic thing. <laughs> like we're not gonna get into that. Um, how can we entice them? to, I think if there are ways for them to demonstrate their work in like non-conventional ways, like beyond writing or, or what have you, um, I think that might be helpful. I guess I'm trying to understand more your particular subject area so that I can get a better picture. Um, just help me understand what the discipline is. Right, so we're a program that focuses mainly on translational work and improving the lives of younger kids in New York. And those kids might um, majorly be involved in 4-H programs. And so a lot of the college students that we work with are working on projects where there might, they might do studies with 4-H kids um, over a diverse, diverse fields involving like attitudes about kids uh, that they have about the environment or climate mm. change and it can mm. range towards um not just though it's not limited to one subject in human development but there are a lot of stories that kids can be working on with their faculty mentors in within the college of human ecology mm -hmm. and so encouraging kids to share what they're doing through pride and what they're doing in their labs with their faculty mentors to the community and to other youth who are in New York who could benefit from that kind of research. Is, yeah. Is I, so I think um, it's always good to get people to connect to just the things in their everyday lives. Like, you know, let's just say we're talking about, again, I'm Caribbean, let's talk about carnival and steel pan and what's the relationship of like, music to to math like these are the kinds of connections I would try to make what's what are the things because sometimes people think especially when young people are working in labs they get an opportunity there is like they may not feel the things in their cultural identity are like necessarily appropriate or relevant but they need to be encouraged to bring examples from their own lives that connect to the work if you know what I mean um we have very specific ideas about what's professional or what's relevant. And there may be something um, like in the household or in the history or the culture or, the, or religion that, that could you know, inform, that could help to open them up to feel comfortable, to, to connect in that way. Does this make sense? Yes, it definitely does. So um, working on um, getting kids to talk more about their identities and their personal experiences and making that mm -hmm. um, relatable to the kids that we're trying to reach mm -hmm. in our community, right? Right, right, right. You know, sometimes I've done um, exercises and this, I've done this for, for poetry as well, where people uh, have to describe themselves using like particular language or, you know, people have to, I've, I've done exercises where they've, um, they're describing the things in their home. These are all like exercises to help writers use more vivid language, or they talk from the perspective of an inanimate object. But like these kind of things unlock, you know, the the immediate environment and and kind of give a better sense of um, 
like who the people are, like who they are, you know? Um, and you know, it's, it's tough for me because I'm not from your, 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 like your area of expertise and discipline. So I'm just hoping that some of these techniques like are, are relatable, <laughs> um, and are helpful to you. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I hope I helped. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Well, why don't we? Oh, is there another question? Sorry, hopping in at the last minute. I'll keep it quick. Go for it. Yeah. Um, Thanks for a wonderful presentation. I would love to hear quickly sort of what, and I mean, you've touched on this a little bit, but if there's sort of anything additional of what are some common pitfalls you see from academics when they're sort of trying to make this jump from a more scholarly presentation to a broader um, presentation? What are common things that tend to get lost or kind of misrepresented or um, just sort of broadly speaking, what what should we be on the lookout for and trying trying to avoid? (laughs) Yeah, that's a great question. So what it is, is your insider language. In your particular discipline, there are things that Everyone who's a scholar in that field, they know those words. They know those keywords. They know what they mean. And so when you're talking to a general audience, what you don't want to happen, say you are on a news program and, you know, you're talking about a spectrometer machine and people have to depart, their attention goes away and they're like, what is that? They Google it or they have a question. You don't want, you want to make sure that you're making one point at a time and that whatever terms that are really germane to the main point that you're summarizing, think of a, think of a, um, a news interview or, or as the abstract of your paper, right? But the abstract, you would go through an exercise of sort of making the language really accessible. So anything that you use when you're explaining your big point, you would have to explain it very simply and quickly, like, um, I don't remember what the spectrometer is, but I know that now I can say spectrometer without tripping over my, my words because I had to work with a faculty member who had some, you know, um, equipment uh, he was working with. But if I say, and I use this uh, XYZ machine, and then I'll say, which is like a big telescope, it, or, but it, it can't be incorrect. So you have to work really carefully to make sure that your comparison is actually accurate, of course, right? But it has to be something that people could understand. Or you can describe it like, you know, imagine two baseballs being thrown up in the air, and then this is what happens, you know? So when we get lost in the insider language of our discipline, which is really important for precision and so that people understand like what the research is about, it may be hard to quickly and like succinctly explain that to people who have no idea who are not in your area of study. It may be hard. So just be careful of that. You know, you want to make your main point. Here's what I did. Here's why it's important to to humanity or to this audience. Um, Here's why you should care about it and look at this problem I solved. Um, And here's the implication for your life. These are kind of like the basic things. And once you get people hooked with their interest, then there's all sorts of subsequent, they can take a deeper dive into your research. You know, podcasts are great format. Radio and podcasts are great formats for long conversations where you can really, really explain these things. And I think it's a great space. Audio is really seeing um, a resurgence right now. Um, Lots of audio, lots of like Clubhouse is a place. Clubhouse is a little noisy. It's a new social media platform, but there are people doing well on there. Um, There's a group that I follow on like psychology and I listen to psychologists talk. I'm not a psychologist, but I'm really interested. They break it down and I understand what they're saying. And their in their way of engaging is in, is uh, lively, so that's just those are some tips. Great, thank you very much. You're welcome. For anybody else who might have a question at some point, if it doesn't come up now, I think um, we know how to reach Keisha. Um, <laughs> oh, let me put my info in here. <laughs> great, yeah, thank you, Keisha. 
Uh, and feel free, I think it's okay if people reach out to you directly with a question. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just putting my info in the chat. Uh, you are free to reach out. I'm putting my website. And then I'll put my email address. Getting lots of great kudos in the chat there, Keisha. I hope you're seeing it. Oh, I really appreciate your time. And it's a lot to, to get into a small space of time. So I tried to keep it high level, but I do hope that it was helpful. And um, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you. Yeah. All right. All right, everybody. Thank you very much, Keisha. It was wonderful. Thank you Thank to those of you who are still here. And I look forward to seeing you all again on another one. All right. Have a great day, everyone.